Welcome back to Tuesday at Dobbs's. It's been a very, very good week for me. I cleaned the Bonneville. That, that is just a lie. I did not clean the Bonneville. I actually paid someone, a professional cleaner, Valia, to clean the Bonneville over the weekend. There'll be a video coming on Freddie Dobbs, my other YouTube channel. First time I've ever had a motorbike freshly cleaned, and I will not go into too much detail, but bottom line, cleaning a bike professionally or if you're good at cleaning it yourself or you have the time it it makes you fall in love with your bike all over again i forgot how amazing a bike looks when it's properly genuinely clean and i don't want to pretend i don't have time to clean it of course i do i'm just lazy but oh to see it glimmering away there the bonneville it's it's a very special thing I didn't realize how much I'd love it actually, genuinely, hand on heart. It feels fantastic. I've also got the Triumph Thruxton downstairs, and that's Triumph's incredible 1200cc engine. Very, very sporty, of course, very aggressive. But the thing I forgot is so, so convenient on a bike having hard panniers, the kind of panniers that take five seconds to open, chuck everything in, close again. Now when I'm going out in the Thruxton, I have to get a backpack out of the cupboard. I have to fill everything with a backpack if I need some waterproofs, if I need some uh, X and Y, whatever it may be. Backpack on and then head off. Then if I need to get something, stop the bike, backpack off, unclip everything and then get my hands in, try and find everything. Hard panniers make everything easier and more usable on a bike. If you want to get in touch, just digressing a bit before I get on to the main body of this week's episode. Hi at choosethatdobs.com for any longer stories or to share some pics. And of course, please leave a comment below. I find them all so fascinating. I appreciate all of them. And of course, Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs for the Instagram channel. Let's begin. Getting parts for older bikes. I do often recommend older bikes. If someone says to me, look, I've got a budget of around about 2K, 2.5K, I will often recommend an older bike to that person, let's say 20 years old or so. And that's purely because that's where bikes start to get really attainable from a financial point of view. But I have had a few people saying that you should not overlook the fact that the older the bike, the harder it is to get parts. And that seems like an obvious thing. But up to or from eight to ten years after a specific bike has been discontinued, a manufacturer doesn't have to legally make parts for that bike. And that can make it tricky. Have a listen to these two points. The Birchwood Biker. Freddie, I have a Triumph Speed Triple that I bought, stolen, recovered seven months ago. I've now been waiting for a full lock set direct from Triumph who have them made in China. It's mad. So actually this may not be from a discontinued model. So apologies for that. But this gentleman bought a stolen recovered speed triple from, it may be from wherever, from an auction, etc, etc. And you can think, right, go onto Triumph's website, order the part, seven months wait because they're made in China. I move on from Josh. Freddie, I wish I could just hop on my main bike at the moment, which is a 2012 Harley Davidson, but the ECU packed up. Harley Davidson say it's obsolete or say it's an obsolete part. So a carb conversion, here we come. Fuel injection isn't always a good thing. Josh, a, a carb conversion. Fascinating on the first point. You can't get an ECU. Even more fascinating that your, your decision on what to do with that, not just accept defeat, but right, turn my Harley Davidson fuel injection into a carbed bike. You know, the interesting thing, Josh, about that is, uh, I think you all know I, I do love Harley Davidsons. I know they're Marmite, but if you love something, you cannot help it. And I love them. And I've been speaking to quite a few Harley owners about a potential bike that I may buy. And I, I go from so many different models. But it seems to be within, within the know, people who, who know about Harleys, the ones they seem to recommend to me are the Harley Davidson Evo, which is, I think, from around about 1980 onwards, maybe 1985 onwards. And the model before that, which I believe is called the Shovelhead. 
and I think that came out in the 70s or so. So the 70s and 80s seem to be the sweet spot for the, the Harley enthusiasts. And the reason they say they're the sweet spot bikes is because apparently they are bulletproof and incredibly simple to work on. They're carbed, very, very, very easy to work on, to get parts for. If something breaks, it's simple. It's just basic mechanics. There are no real specialist parts that are going to leave you in a tricky situation if, for example, something breaks. Most things can be worked out with common sense without too many electronics. So I found that really interesting. But it is a thing I've been hearing a lot about, older bikes, difficulty getting parts for. I move on. I had to share this. This is Nicholas. Uh, I just found this. The most beautiful little setup shed with a stunning looking Norton. I, I had to share this on here. I think I'll share this on Instagram as well. Hi, Freddie. I'm 27 years old and I'm a motorbike and scooter. That's Vespa and Lambretta. Mad. I've just bought a 1973 Norton Commando 850 Roadster. Let me put some pics up here. This is Nicholas. This is fantastic. What a stunning bike. And in a simple little wooden shed, but you've done it out so nicely with the seat on the side. It looks brilliant. I continue. I've, it's always been a dream of mine to own a Norton Commando. And I think I found the right one at a good price. This is six and a half thousand pounds. It's fantastic. I'm a collector of Lambrettas and Vespers, but I always wanted to own a classic bike that I could tour on around Europe. That's the plan, to ride from here in Leicester, England, to Nis, which is a city in Serbia where my parents have moved to. My page just for bikes. If anyone wants to follow Vintage Rider 66, Nicholas, thank you. That, that Norton Commando is one of the most beautiful bikes. And I usually like my bikes in, in subdued colors, black or silver, things like that, but in yellow. Nicholas, it's pure art. Thank you for sharing that. And if you manage to make that on that Norton over to Serbia, that will be a trip of a lifetime. I move on. Freddie, I've got a question which I'm hoping you could help me out with. It's a bit of a challenge. As a new rider at 25 who has just passed their direct access, that's the one week intensive rider training. I have a budget of 3,000 pounds as I've only just graduated and got a job. I'm not a big fan of naked and sports bikes. What would you recommend I look into? People are constantly advising me not to get a carved motorcycle as a newer rider. I'm not sure what I should be looking at, if not old retros, Sundar. Right, Sunda, this didn't take me too long to decide. You like retro bikes, you want modern reliability, you don't want the hassle of having to deal with carbs or anything like that. And the key here is you need a bike that's nice and easy to live with. Because if you go into biking with a bike that's difficult to live with and work on and maintain, it will put you off biking if you're not a huge mechanical enthusiast, a bit like me me not being a mechanical enthusiast. And I found something, Sundar, and I do not think you have to look any further than this. I really don't. Royal Enfield Meteor. This is a bike that came out probably three or four, God, maybe four years, maybe three. Am I going crazy? Maybe even two or three years ago, but the Royal Enfield Meteor. You can pick these up for 2,700 pounds. 2,700 pounds. In fact, they may even be newer than I thought. Maybe they're not even three years old. I found, you won't believe this, a one-year-old Royal Enfield Meteor 350 on Facebook Marketplace with 2,400 miles on the clock. And it's 2,750 pounds. And have a listen, Sundar, to this description. I'll be putting pictures up here so you can have a look. In great condition. Heated grips, sports screen, sports exhaust silencer, hard panniers comes with it. Also comes with original exhaust and it was bought new by the mature owner, reluctant sale. You are in essence, Sundar, getting a brand new bike 
well, well within your budget. I really don't think you can do better than that. 20 horsepower, look, it's perfectly fine. You'll do 70 miles an hour on the motorway and it's gloriously comfortable all day. I think I did six hours in Tenerife in one day on that. Complete comfort and they look brilliant. They've got that retro style. You'll love it, Sundar. Highly, highly recommended. That's what I'd go for if I was in your position. And Sundar, if I was, if, if I go back 13 years to when I passed my test, and things like this were in the market or on the market for me, I would buy this bike because I paid £1,850 for what was then a 2005, I think, Honda CB500F, which is a fairly boring commuter bike, if I'm being completely honest. But you couldn't dream, really, of finding something modern and stylish at that price. And with inflation, we're bang on about the same budget here. So... Thank you to Royal Enfield for making that possible with bikes like that just one year old. I move on. As Sundar, happy riding. Welcome to the world of biking. I move on to Richard. Freddie, I'm tempted to move from my KLV 1000 to a nice retro style machine. The one thing holding me back is the level of wind and weather protection. Irish weather is chronic bar three months of the year. Can a retro style bike be fitted with decent weather protection without ruining the looks and vibe. Richard, this is something I, I often think about. It's a really interesting question, especially for me in my eyes as well, because the obvious avenue to go down, if you want a bike, a retro style bike with lots of wind protection, weather protection, and everything that goes with it, well, you go for a cruiser, you go for a Harley Davidson or an Indian. So we've got those as a backup, but let's say you want more the style of a Bonneville or a Royal Enfield or a BMW R90, something like that. I think the musts, bearing in mind you live in Ireland and the, the weather is, let's say it's changeable. You, you have to have a, a, a windscreen. You have to have a screen at the front of the bike, uh, knowing that you really want some weather protection. I think you really need heated grips on the bike as well. They are a bit of a game changer too. And one other thing I'd have if I were you, Richard, I'd, I would say hard panniers are almost a must because when it starts pouring down and getting really blustery in Ireland or wherever you may be, you need panniers that are ultra quick to get to. So quickly get to the panniers, open them up, great. Right hand pannier, I've got my waterproofs that I can quickly chuck on, shut the pannier, nice and waterproof, nothing to worry about. Whereas if you've got more difficult panniers to open up on either side, it just takes too long. So very, very well designed, easy to open and close panniers, I would say are essential for you as well. But what's it like? Let's have a look, for example, and say that we're looking at the Triumph Bonneville T100 or the Speedmaster on triumph.co.uk. You can get a screen for those if you option the bike the way you want it to. They both come with screens if you're willing to pay the money. For example, the Triumph Speedmaster, that's got a big tall screen that should come fairly close to the top of your head. And that is 400, sit down, and just soak this number in, because I had to sit down for a second. It's quite hard saying it. It's four, 445 pounds for the screen. So that takes the cost of a Speedmaster with a screen to 13,440 pounds. If, however, you like the look of the Triumph Bonneville T100 and you want a screen on that, well, I'm quite impressed with this. You can also get the T100 with a Triumph factory screen. Completely clear screen, very well shaped, comes up just above the mirrors and it just arches round either side of the headlamp. And I don't think either screen here for the Bonnevilles or for the Bonneville or the Speedmaster take away from the looks at all. I used to find, especially with my model Triumph, there was no good looking screen that didn't really take away from the look of the bike. However, with the new crop of Triumphs, I think you will be in good hands there. Even the T100, I honestly don't believe that that screen takes away from the look of the bike. The only thing you have to come to terms with, Richard, is the money that you have to pay for that screen. It's a lot, but 
Get that coupled with heated grips and get some hard panniers. I've got Hep Come Back, or you can get Triumph. And I think that will be enough to protect you from the worst of the Irish weather. If anyone else has any tips, good looking retro bike with wind protection, let me know. One other, Moto Guzzi V85TT, check that out as well. I move on from David. Freddie is doing an intensive direct access course worth it, whereby you can pass your test and go from never having ridden to passing in a week. What do you think the statistics of persons passing both Mod 1 and Mod 2 first time in under a week on bikes over 550cc that have never touched a bike except on the CBT course? And I had a reply to this actually, JW, thank you for jumping in here. Replying to David, I did exactly what you asked about except that I failed my first test through absent-mindedness, but I did pass the second time. It's thoroughly important to choose a good school though. My instructors were still very passionate about biking and showed us early on the skills to be envied. This is a really good point, David. If you're looking to do a direct access course, having never ridden before, to hopefully having passed in a week, I know what's going through your head. You're scared that you're going to bankrupt yourself because that's what was going through my head. I think it will cost, let's say about 850 pounds now to do the course. And you'll be scared that you'll be throwing money down the toilet if you don't pass. But I promise you, these courses will take you from never having ridden to being good enough to pass your test. But as JW said, the school that you go with can vary hugely. I'll give you an example. I had my dad and two friends and they all went to the same riding school in St Albans. They all hated it. They thought the instructors were rude and shouldn't be teaching, and they found them aggressive with a very, very short spans of being, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Attention spans, tolerance spans, if you weren't learning quickly enough. They all despised their week of learning. However, I went to a place in southwest London, around the Kingston area. I could not have had more fun. I was so excited every day to wake up and head off to the riding school. I, I loved every second of it. All of the examiners, the instructors, everyone around could not have been more lovely. I mean, I still failed first time, but it makes a huge difference to learning. I failed my Mod 1 first time, to give an example, and I'd already paid £650. And the annoying thing for me was, you go down to the test and I was there with one other person and we had learnt for the same amount of time. We went down to the test, I did my mod one first, so you're driving around doing figure of eight and things like that. I blacked out and I failed badly and then the personnel, the other person who was learning, they went in for their test after me, mod one, and they passed. And that was, that was, uh, quite a painful ride back because I had the person next to me who was elated because they'd passed. We had one and a half hour ride back to the riding school from the examination center. One person was completely elated and I was devastated, absolutely devastated. So I was riding along on the motorway just like a vegetable wishing I could get home as quickly as possible. And I said in my mind after that, I was only doing a simple job at the time. If I fail this again, mod one, which I booked immediately after, I don't have any more money to book another one. So I gave myself one final chance to pass both mod one and two, and that was booked for two weeks later. Luckily I passed, but if I would have failed, I may have had to wait another year before I could save up enough money and do it again, because it does start getting very, very painful financially. But yes, to answer your question, David, one week you can do it, 100%, no question at all. I move on. This is interesting. Biking insurance and no claims discount. From the Scarlet Pimpernel. I had to read out that name. Freddie, with regards to protecting no claims bonus and insurance companies in general, it actually goes far deeper than making a claim. Insurance companies will log or flag your account even if you phone them and let them know that there's been an incident, that alone will ramp up your premium. 
I had a sat-nav stolen from my van. They smashed the small triangular window to get at it. Silly me for leaving it out. But I phoned my insurance to ask if it was worth making a claim or was the window covering included, etc. Purely to weigh up my options. But it turned out that it was cheaper to just find a second-hand one and fit it myself and I didn't actually need to make a claim. So... The insurance renewal comes around and my premium is nearly double. I questioned why this is. And they said, uh, with the date that I had recorded an incident that year, do not tell insurance companies anything unless you're actually going to make a claim. Yeah, Scarlet Pimpernel, I second this. I had exactly the same thing happen. I called up to make a query, um, look, is it worth claiming? Should I do that? I've had a little ding, but I think I don't think it's worth claiming. Nope. Insurance company will write that down and that will be, in essence, them knowing that you have had a little incident. That is genuinely what they do. Uh, let me read one more from this. One more story and I could have shared a whole load, actually. Freddie, the segment about insurance triggered a thought in me. That, may be sharing, uh, that made me share my tale and it may be of interest to others. I also think bike insurance is, sub is a subject worthy of its own video, so my story, I'm sure, is not uncommon. In November 2022, I was in an accident on my Suzuki V-Strom 1000, where I was taken out by a car driver whilst overtaking him. The accident was the car driver's fault and he was charged with careless driving at the scene. I was lucky that my injuries were relatively minor, but the bike was a write-off. I've learned some lessons in the process, but it's been expensive. Be aware of the claims telephone number on your insurance documents. It might be for a separate claims company and not your actual insurance company. The claims company didn't make it very clear that my claim was to be assigned to a third party directly and not through my own insurance. They're very quick at offering you a hire bike. Have a listen to this. They're very quick at offering you a hire bike, which they say will be paid for by the third party, but whose costs rack up at an alarming rate. Should they fail to get the costs back from the third party, you can be liable as you signed the hire forms yourself. There was also significant storage costs for the bike whilst waiting for the third party insurers to do their damage assessment. I could see the costs getting alarmingly high, so I gave the hire car, or the hire bike, sorry, back early, and I've seen some bad review comments for the claims company where they've stung the drivers for huge bike hire costs. Anyway, the whole process was just taking far too long. The third party insurer just ignored the claim for months. And in the end, I gave up and claimed on my own insurance. And I took the hit myself. At least I could get the replacement bike I wanted sooner rather than later. If this happens again, I will be very wary of inadvertently using a claims company to pursue a claim. And I'll also be very reluctant to pursue personal injury compensation either. The personal injury compensation process was an eye opener and left a bad taste in my mouth. I can now see how the business model works for claims companies and accident legal companies, and I do not want to be part of it again. Dave. Dave, that was probably the most eye-opening one I've had. I wanted to share a quick thing here, because there was one other person who said, protecting your no claims discount. No, it's good. It does work. And please do bear in mind, I may well be wrong here, but I do disagree with this. One writer wrote and said it's good to protect it because look, whatever happens to your insurance, let's say you've made a claim, but if you've got no claims bonus, no claims discount protected, every year that you've got that discount, every increasing year, it will drop the premium, let's say by a certain amount, a certain percentage. So if you do have a claim, if you've got five years no claims protected, that five years no claims, let's say, will still protect you by 50%. So it will still drop the premium, whatever it may be, by 50%. And if you've got four years no claims bonus, it will 
just protect you and drop the premium by 40%. So whatever the premium is, the no claims discount will drop it by 50% or 40% or 30% or 20%, depending on how many years you've got. But I disagree with this. And I wanted to do a check here to confirm if I'm right. So what I did, I checked on an Indian chief and I wanted to find out if I put my no claims discount, instead of my 12 years, I put it to five years, 18,000 pound value motorcycle, fully comprehensive for five years, no claims discount is 445 pounds for me which initially I found interesting because it's noticeably more than I had when I did a quote a week or two ago. So it really also does depend on timing, which I found fascinating. It's about 150 more, I'm sure if I remember correctly, than me getting a quote eight days ago. That's by the by, 444 pounds, 445 pounds. Next, I reduced my no claims discount by one year. So instead of having five years no claims discount, I put that I had four years no claims discount. Nothing else changed at all. And my premium went from £445 a year to £461 a year, meaning it costs or it saves me having that extra year of no claims discount, just £16 a year. I then did one final thing. I put the truth that I've got 12 years no claims discount. And with 12 years no claims discount, my insurance premium, 403 pounds a year. Meaning the difference between four years no claims discount and 12 years no claims discount is just 42 pounds a year. And I believe in my mind at least, that proves that no claims discount protection there's just no point at all because these insurance companies will do whatever they possibly can to find ways of making you part with more money. And protected no claims discount is one of those ways. I truly believe it's not worth it in, in any area, in any scenario at all. But of course, fire back to me if you, if you disagree. I move on to Paul, Freddie. If you're interested in a good, reliable all-rounder, then let me introduce you to my BMW R1150R. I've had this bike for some time now, and I used to chop and change my bikes very often until I got this one. I love the look of it. It's so comfy. I can ride all day without any pain. So I've toured Wales every, several times, and I still get the smile when I'm riding it. It can be a tourer to a naked in three easy steps. I did a straight swap for this bike. Now this is interesting, a Honda VFR 800 you swapped. The amount of people, Paul, that I hear going the other way, interestingly, BMW's two Honda VFR 800s, but you went the other way. Uh, she's an old girl at 22 years old, but my God, she still pulls like she's new and you don't see many of them around. Okay, let me have a look at this, Paul. First of all, let me see if I've got this on MCN. Motorcycle News, 2001. Let's have a look at the, the background. 2001 to 2006 bike. Owner's reliability rating, four and a half out of five stars. But this is the interesting thing. MCN rating on the BMW, three out of five stars. Owner's rating of the BMW R1150, 4.2 out of 5. So if you're looking for, see if I can find one of these, a lovely looking, and I really like the look of these, BMW Facebook Marketplace, you can pick one up for £2,300. 2002 model BMW in Belfast, Northern Ireland. 35,000 miles on the clock, in red, looks Looks brilliant. It looks really, really good with the classic boxer engine, stripped back, very, very little plastic around with BMW hard panniers on either side. Beautiful analog clocks as well. It's just so much bike for the money. 2,300. Paul, thank you. I move on to, to Karina in Tasmania. Freddie, after much research and giving my brain a good workout, Karina, you shock me. I've decided I want to sell my 2023, my 2023 CF Moto 700 CLX Adventure. This is Karina's 
bike, exactly her bike here. It's only six months old and, and I'm going to get a second-hand Bonneville T100. Karina, I can't remember if I shared it or not, but I read your email where you sent me a pic of this CF Moto. It may have been a couple of months ago and you were really happy with it but I guess it just wasn't quite the right bike for you. Fascinating. My issue is that I've been spoilt for choice with all of the latest mod cons like ABS, liquid water cooling on my last few bikes. I've taken a few Bonneville T100s on a test ride. One of them was a 2014 model. The other was a 2015 model. No ABS, air cooled and no other latest tech. My question. Do I go for Bonneville T100 later than 2016 to get the ABS and the water cooling? Or do I stick to the old school pre-2016, no ABS, air cooled, etc.? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so Karina, as you know, I've got the, the older school one, which has the, it's got little manual choke on the side, it's air cooled, it is... What else did we say? Oh, no ABS, so no rider modes, nothing at all. Pretty much as simple as you can get, apart from actually a carved bike. For whatever model you go for, Karina, you don't have to worry about reliability because I honestly believe it's impossible to get a simpler, cheaper, more reliable, more rugged bike than my model of Bonneville. They go on forever and they can do anything. So reliability shouldn't be a factor in your eyes. Just go for what you like the look and feel of more. And I'll give you an example on this. Hand on heart, and it's a bit painful for me to say this, I do actually prefer the looks of the newer T100s from 2016 onwards, the 900cc air-cooled engine. I think they look like a slightly better looking, more filled out bike. I think Triumph have improved it there. So if I had both side by side, mine and the newer model, and I had the money for either of them and I didn't own mine, I feel like I'm cheating here, but I would actually go for the newer one, even though my one wants for nothing at all. Handling's good, everything's perfect, but I would go for the newer one. So I would just focus on what you like the looks of more because honestly, you don't need ABS, you don't need rider modes or anything like that because they're not powerful enough to worry about any of that stuff at all. So I would say it will come down to looks more than anything else at all. And also you do get that more old school vibe with mine. My model does feel much, much less refined and more old school feeling than the newer crop. So if you're more inclined to that side of things, go for mine, uh, otherwise focus on the looks. Karina, send me a pic, let me know how you get on. And Tasmania. I've heard good things, I need to get over there. I've heard it's amazing for riding. What a place to live. Final one here from Charles. Let's do, let me call this the bike for the week. Freddie, check out the Yamaha VXS 1300. Half the price of a Harley Davidson, twice as reliable. Charles. Charles, okay, let's have a look at this to wrap this up. Someone, is this a good tip? Someone to get a lovely bike for, for the start of riding season. I'm going on to MCN here to check it out. This came out in 2014 and I think they may still make these. Stunning looking bike. It really does look very, very similar to a Harley Davidson Street Bob. It's an incredibly good looking cruiser, this. Really very, very good. But here's the interesting thing. MCN rate this bike four out of five stars. Owners, which I usually prefer looking at, rate this bike as three out of five stars. However, owners do give a reliability rating of 4.7 out of five, meaning in essence, it doesn't break down. Well, I don't know why the other scores are so low then. Uh, 72 horsepower, it is 293 kilos. And let me wrap up with finding one for you here. Facebook Marketplace, 2008, in fact, this is a slightly older one, but this has the 1300cc engine, which looks every bit as good. £5,000 for 2008 Yamaha XVS 1300cc Midnight. All black with highlights of chrome everywhere. 12,000 miles on the clock with a gigantic 
1300 cc engine reading from the seller here absolute stunner of a bike only very lightly used sad to be sold but just does not get used enough to warrant keeping never had any issues with it just start and run comes with leather panniers windshield passenger backrest luggage rack custom vance and heinz exhaust i tell you what richard i think it was in ireland You've got the wind protection here as well. You've got the hard panniers. You've got the wind protection. Looks stunning. Five grand. And it's been reduced by 500 pounds. It's a lovely looking bike. Really, really awful pictures as well from the seller. Really atrociously blurry pics. So hopefully not many people will be calling up about it. So you may not have too much competition there. Wrap it up there. Lovely looking thing. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along on this week's episode. Again, leave all of your thoughts in the comments, share your opinions and get in touch with any stories you have. I hope you all have a fantastic week and I'll speak to you all in the next one.